Why do children forget what they've learned? And how can the way we structure our lessons help children to remember the material we've covered in class? The graph you can see on your screen is the forgetting curve. It's a simplification, of course, but it's an important one. It shows memory and time, and it reveals what every teacher knows, but what in our profession we're never allowed to acknowledge. Children forget things. Most members of senior management in most schools seem to think that if the children have forgotten something, the only possible explanation is that they didn't properly understand it in the first place, probably because we didn't teach it well enough, we used the wrong strategies, we used too much teacher talk, there wasn't a wow element in our lesson starter, and so on. And yes, some of these things can make a difference, but the truth is, no matter how we teach, no matter how well we teach, children forget most of what they've learned. So how do we stop children forgetting what we've taught them? We review the learning often. Look at the red line on the graph. It shows that after we learn something, we forget about half of what we've learned within a day. But look at the slopes on the other curves. Notice how the forgetting curve is a bit flatter if you learn or practice something after one day, then flatter still if you practice it again the next day, and flatter still the day after. So if we want the children to remember what they've learned, we should space out our teaching of it and the children's practice of it throughout the whole week. We should break up the learning into short sessions of no more than 10 minutes. This is known as distributed practice, space repetition or interleaving. There are multiple studies demonstrating that if you want to learn something, and this applies not just to learning maths and other curriculum subjects, but to learning anything, you learn more and remember more of what you've learned if that learning is broken up into short sessions spread out over multiple days rather than crammed into one long session. Let's think about how most lessons in most schools are structured at the moment. In one single maths lesson, for example, we might teach the children the skill, then use talk partners and whiteboard work, then get the children to answer a few problems with the help of their partner, then get the children to answer questions in silence, then finally get the children to journal how they solved a problem. All of these things help the children learn. They're all good ideas. And there's not even anything wrong with doing things in that order. The problem is simply that all of this happens in one lesson, on one day. And so, by the end of the week, unless the learning is reviewed, children will have forgotten most of what they learned. So what should we be doing instead? Well, on day one, we should teach the children the skill. For maths, use the maths PowerPoints that you can download for free on keystage2maths.com to support your teaching input, or use the linked YouTube videos. These are typically four or five minutes long, Given that you'll have to hit the pause button often if you're using video effectively, that's ideal for a 10-minute teaching input. Day 2 is guided learning. You should review the skill, but perhaps also encourage children to explain the concept to each other in talk partners and answer a question on their mini whiteboard or in the back of their book. Again, we're using 10-minute chunks here. So with this approach, the timing of your lessons is really important. On day three, 
we might get the children to answer some questions with their partner for about 10 minutes. On day four, we might get children to answer a few questions on the topic in silence for about 10 minutes. And on day five, we might get the children to journal explaining how they solved a problem, again for about 10 minutes. That's 50 minutes of learning, but spaced out over five days. Day one won't necessarily be Monday. In fact, it makes more sense to be on different days for different topics, because few children will be able to listen to a whole lesson of teaching input, even if different topics are covered. So in each lesson, you should aim to do all of the things listed above with your class, but each part of the lesson should cover a different learning objective. So, in one year five maths lesson, you might teach children how to find missing digits in column sub subtraction. Then you might review the lesson you started with yesterday on identifying prime numbers, getting the children to answer some questions on their mini whiteboards, and explain the concept to each other in talk partners. Then, you might get the children to work with their partner to answer questions on adding fractions with different denominators, which you first taught them two lessons ago. Then, the children might work in silence, rounding decimals to the nearest tenth, which you taught them three lessons ago. Then you might get children to journal their reasoning for a question on nets of 3D shapes, something you first introduced to your class four lessons ago. For the last 10 minutes of your lesson, you might give most of the class a 10 minute test on topics that you covered a few weeks ago, while you give focused support to a small group. Then you can see here how the same topics can be repeated over the following days while you still begin each lesson by introducing something new. Notice that here, not only are different learning objectives covered in the same lesson, but completely different subject areas are covered. In most existing schemes of work for maths, you're told to spend about half a term on addition and subtraction, then cover multiplication and division, then fractions, then decimals and measurement, then geometry and statistics. Sometimes the order is slightly different, but the idea that you need to focus on one area at a time is always the same. But the problem with this is that if you're not constantly reviewing each topic area, Although children might have answered lots of questions correctly in their books, they won't be able to recall that learning in their end of year exams. They won't be able to remember everything they're meant to have learned, and they won't make the progress that they're capable of making. Notice the suggestion that the last 10 minutes of each lesson is used to give children a test on topics covered a few weeks ago. By test, I don't mean a formal exam, I just mean give them a few questions and see if they can solve them without any help. You could even use the same questions that you used when you were first introducing a topic. In fact, you should use the same questions. Children should learn the method but they won't be able to memorise the exact answers, and why create more work for yourself? And while most of the class are taking the test, you could use this time to work with a smaller number of children who have found a particular topic difficult, giving them some additional support. What is the advantage of testing children? Well, think back to the forgetting curve. We've seen that spaced repetition will help children retain what they've learned, but for most topics, the forgetting curve won't be completely flat even after a week of spaced repetition. The way to flatten the curve is to regularly test children on previous learning. 
once children know how to do something, to help them retain that knowledge, testing is more effective than reviewing what they've learned in a revision session. I'll say that again, the best science tells us that once children have learnt something, to reinforce the learning, to get that learning into their long-term memory, it's more effective to just give them a test than it is to use whole class teaching to review the learning. This is known as the testing effect. So testing isn't just about giving you information on, on what children know, it's also an effective strategy to flatten the forgetting curve and help children retain what they've learned. And in the test you give to children, you could make sure that consecutive problems can't be solved using the same strategy, and give children feedback showing the solutions so that they can correct their mistakes. So to summarise, first, stop cramming one topic into one lesson under one learning objective. Instead, spread it out throughout the week, breaking it down into 10 minute chunks. Second, help children to retain what you've taught them by regularly testing them. So with the status quo, with the way that lessons are typically structured at the moment, we're letting children down. There's a huge gap between what we know about learning and memory and what we put into practice. Why do we see this gap? The problem we have is partly that school leaders just aren't literate in educational research. The forgetting curve that I started this presentation with is included in almost every first year undergraduate psychology textbook, but we haven't translated that into good classroom practice. Of course, even with the spaced learning approach, children might still find something difficult. They might still need some focused support from you. You might still need to take them back a few steps. But be honest, which of these is the biggest problem for you at the moment? Is it that children don't get it within the lesson? Or is it that children have forgotten it by the end of the year, even though the work in their book shows that when you first taught it, they understood? The issue most teachers have isn't with teaching, but with structuring lessons so that children re can retain what they've learned. And here's the thing, here's the reason why even school leaders who understand memory and learning will be reluctant to adopt the spaced learning approach. The books might not look as good. The work the children complete in the books might not seem as impressive, because children might not be able to answer as many questions. Children can zip through a blocked assignment where all the questions require them to use the same strategy. But spaced learning forces children to think carefully before they can remember how to solve a question, which means they might complete fewer questions. The whole point of this approach isn't that children do more work, but that they remember more. People assume that if children complete more questions, they'll be more likely to remember the method. But look at this study, published in the journal Applied Cognitive Psychology. Getting people to complete nine problems wasn't any more effective in helping people to remember a method than getting them to complete three problems. Similar studies have found the same results. But what was effective, what made a huge difference, was spacing out the problems into more than one session. But there's another reason why even school leaders who understand this will be reluctant to adopt the spaced learning approach. Ofsted won't be impressed. Inspectors typically observe teachers for about 20 minutes, and in that time, they want to see evidence of new learning. And of course, if children are practicing a skill that they learned in previous lessons, that isn't new learning, 
So even though it's helping children to commit what they've learned to long-term memory, it's unlikely to receive a good review from an inspector. So if you're a teacher and you think that what I've explained here makes sense, the chances are that you won't be able to put these recommendations into practice, or at least not put them fully into practice. There is always some wriggle room, so focus on taking advantage of that. For example, I teach in a school that insists on one single learning objective for each lesson, but does at least allow us to recap previous learning in lesson starters. So I make sure that my starter is on something that I've taught previously, which is unrelated to the rest of the lesson. I also take a maths intervention during assembly time, and here at least I'm given much more freedom to teach as I want, and I take advantage of that. So your school will probably give you some flexibility, even if it's not as much flexibility as you'd like. And understanding the psychology of learning will help you to take advantage of those changes that you can make to benefit the children you teach. This is my second video on topics related to teaching and psychology, and I'm hoping to use this channel to spark some discussion and debate among teachers. So use the comments to let me know what you think, and if you found the content here thought-provoking or valuable, please share it with others on social media.